Hello and good day to all of you from around the globe. Thank you for joining us on day two of the 2022 IWMF Virtual Education Forum. I'm Bob Perry uh, and I have lived with WM for seven years, but I've probably had it for longer than that. And I'm the patient support manager for WM UK, the charity in England uh, for England, the United Kingdom and Ireland. I live with my wife, Deborah, in Bournemouth on the south coast of England. I'm delighted to be introducing this session, which is called Cancer and Mental Health Are Hard. How are you doing today? As the subject of mental health is very close to my heart. Away from WM, I volunteer locally with troubled military veterans from the many conflicts over the past 50 years, PTSD, anxiety, desperation, depression and loneliness. And in my MUK work, mental health is at the forefront of my mind when I talk to the uh, community especially around the bizarreness uh, of being given an incurable cancer diagnosis and then told to go away for three months because we're not going to do anything. And right down to the anxiety around various treatments, the next blood work and general feeling of apprehension over what happens next. As importantly, I'm always mindful of our families, partners, carers who embark on this journey with us and alongside us. So it's an absolute pleasure for me to introduce today uh, Jennifer Byers. Jennifer uh, is an oncology social worker and the executive director of Life with Cancer and Patient Experience for the Innova Shah Cancer Institute. As an expert in psychosocial care and he healing arts, Jennifer will take us through some of the physiological and psychological concerns that so often accompany a rare disease diagnosis. So get your questions ready. Uh, in the chat box or the question box uh, for Jennifer, uh, and we'll put some of those questions to her at the end. So Jennifer, welcome, and uh, thank you so much for joining us on a Sunday to do your presentation. Over to you. Great, thank you, Bob. So good to be here with everyone today. We're gonna talk about cancer and mental health. Um, we're gonna go through some specific uh, diagnoses like anxiety and depression, but then also talk about some strategies for resilience today. Um, I just want to start off, you know, touching on something that Bob mentioned about this idea to learning to live with uncertainty. Um, and sometimes this fear of when the other shoe will drop or having a foot on a banana peel. And really, um, our belief windows are shattered. So oftentimes uh, with a diagnosis like WM, it calls into question things that we believed about ourselves, our health, um, how the world works, and really calls into account um, really the unpredictable nature. We know after a diagnosis of any cancer and WM that uh, there are some key stress periods. So certainly the diagnosis and sometimes earlier as it can take sometimes to be diagnosed, uh, the treatment or side effects, or even in periods of stability um, of waiting for what's gonna come next or how long you'll feel, how you're gonna feel, uh, thinking about end of life issues or how you'll be cared for, um, those are all, you know, important periods to pay attention to. And you can go along with a relative area of stability and then something may change, which can kind of kick you back into a, a key stress period. And, and also we know that a diagnosis of WM doesn't just impact one piece of you, like your physical body, but that it also can impact your behavior, your cognition, um, how your psychological well-being is doing. And so this multifactorial um, impact on your life can, can feel significant. So um, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, NCCN, developed um, a definition for the word distress. And oftentimes we wanna look at distress because we wanna make sure that people who are experiencing distress have access to resources um, and get help with coping mechanisms. So distress is designed as a multifactorial, unpleasant experience of a psychological, social, spiritual, and or physical nature that may interfere with the ability to cope effectively with cancer is physical symptoms and its treatment. So you can see that this definition takes into account um, the four areas that I had on the previous slide. And I think this is important because it 
it recognizes that, you know, we're not only talking about depression or anxiety, and we will talk about those, but that, you know, just a diagnosis of cancer can um, lead to distress, which can impact our well-being. And that's, that's normal. And so experiencing these things is not normal, and you're not alone in that. Um, I wanted to talk briefly just about the acute stress reaction and really getting a diagnosis of cancer and, and really the subsequent treatments can cause a stress reaction. And that's when our sympathetic nervous system is activated. And the sympathetic nervous system is that fight or flight. And so we're not really getting into that rest and digest state that our body needs. And that can, um, that can be really tiring and it's happening over and over, oftentimes with a cancer diagnosis. And so finding ways to get back to that rest and digest period can be really important. And we'll talk about some of those towards the end of the end of the presentation, but really just realizing what your body is going through um, can be very important. And when this acute stress response happens, all of our organ systems are impacted. You know, our GI system, our muscles, um, different hormones are released, our heart may beat faster, um, our, we may feel a tightening in our chest or a difficulty breathing. And, and really our whole body says, oh no, something's going on. And sometimes this can be for something really significant. You know, it was designed for when a tiger was chasing us so that we could escape. But oftentimes with a cancer diagnosis, it happens with small things, you know, like walking into a medical building or the telephone ringing. And so our bodies are constantly be putting into this stress state, um, which, which isn't good for our well-being. Um, in this chronic stress state, you know, our body never really has a chance to rest. Uh, and and like I mentioned, you know, even walking into a physician visit can cause this. And we know that there's a lot of physician visits with a diagnosis. Anxiety is another, uh, another thing that comes up for people often. Um, and this is a common and normal response to new and stressful situations. Um, maybe, you know, your mind is thinking, what if I get sicker? How will this diagnosis impact my quality of life? What if I can't take care of myself? At any moment, things could change or I could I could lose everything. And again, that unpredictability of a diagnosis, kind of not knowing what's going to come next, not knowing, you know, if you can trust your body anymore can really lead to some of that anxiety. Um, I like this cartoon. It says, uh, don't panic. I'm just a sore throat. And I think this comes up a lot for people with a cancer diagnosis because oftentimes they had symptoms before they were diagnosed. And so really paying attention to what's happening in your body is a great thing. It's how we take care of ourselves, but it also can make a cold scary or feeling tired scary. And so learning to differentiate between listening to your body but not get caught up in an anxiety spiral can be really important. And also, you know, there's a difference between anxiety and fear. Fear oftentimes is directed at something concrete and external. So, um, you know, something that we can see where anxiety oftentimes is more internal. It's uh, in response to something that's distant or vague, less tangible, that we don't necessarily know if it's gonna happen or not, but we are anticipating something in the future. And that anticipation can lead to, to what we call anxiety. Um, there's, there's a difference between acute anxiety and chronic anxiety. Um, I think, you know, both are important and they kind of interchange with each other, but they have different ways that they may show up. And so if anxiety is something that is that you feel like you're experiencing, these are some of the different symptoms that fall in both buckets. Um, it's not necessarily important which one you're experiencing, although with chronic anxiety, we do tend to see like more difficulty sleeping, irritability, fatigue, because it's going on for a longer time period. Um, 
And so what, what can the impact be of this? You know, the impact can, can show up in different ways for different people, but it may cause you to um, limit the decisions that you're making. So why should I go back to school? Why should I change jobs? Is it even safe to change jobs? Uh, questioning how long you'll be living. What's the point of saving? Uh, should I, can I book a trip or travel? Uh, and that can lead us to be, you know, depressed and angry. You know, it's difficult when we can't make plans and it's difficult when we don't know what the future is. And so sometimes that may impact our relationships, how we relate to other people. It can feel very isolating. Um, you may not uh, feel comfortable talking about this with friends or family. And so then it can be difficult to connect with people. And like I've mentioned, it can really be exhausting to have these thoughts happening in our heads all the time. Um, and, and also these feelings of isolation. Um, so no one knows what you're going through. WM is so rare that oftentimes you may not know anyone else with the illness, or if you do, it's someone that's far away from you. Your family and friends may not quite know um, exactly what you're going through. And so um, it's hard to connect with other people. But as humans, that connection is so important. And we've noticed this even more with COVID lately. With COVID, it's even a more increased isolation because um, being immunocompromised, it may not feel safe to be in crowds or even in small, small gatherings with people. And so this isolation causes a lot of loneliness and also gives you a lot of time to be thinking in your head and um, thinking about the future, which oftentimes can lead to more anxiety or fear. But we know that we all need to be supported in our lives. Um, that is what is so important is that human connection. Um, and so making sure that you can open yourself to connection, open yourself to help and assistance can be really important in your mental health and your well-being. Um, I thought this picture of the dog helping the cat across the pool was really cute, but we all need help in lives. And so figuring out how we can ask for help and make ourselves available to help can be in a really important piece of taking care of our mental health. Um, additionally, really this idea to live in the moment. So the ability to be in the present moment is a major component of mental wellness. And we know that's true because when we're thinking about the future, we oftentimes don't have control of what's happening in the future. And we tell ourselves stories that may or may not be true. And so really when we think about anxiety um, and even depression to some extent, this ability to be present in the moment, um, using our senses to really take part of what's happening in that present moment can be a big help in managing anxiety. Um, so part of that is relaxation techniques, which I've just talked about a little bit. There is medication, um, talk therapy or support groups can be really helpful. Exercise and healthy nutrition are all pieces that can really help with managing anxiety when it comes up. Depression is something else we think of when we think about mental health. There is an increase in depression for people who um, have been diagnosed with cancer as compared to the normal population. And I don't know if we have any caregivers on today, but, but caregivers are also really impacted by this because um, there is a lot of loss of control and really a sense of helplessness sometimes as a caregiver. And so we know that um, depression, which is kind of a notch up from distress, can can really interfere with well-being. Things that you want to look like look for: um, sadness and hopelessness, or kind of an empty mood, a loss of interest or pleasure in activities, weight loss or weight gain when not dieting, sleep changes, tiredness and low energy, kind of feeling restless, difficulty making decisions. Um, and sometimes depression can be hard to tell apart from symptoms that we're experiencing or from side effects from treatment. Uh, so oftentimes, really, um, what we look at is that loss of interest or pleasure activities. So it's less about being too tired to do something and more about, you know, not being able to find the joy in those activities. Why does this happen? Uh, you know, we don't, the brain is such a complex organism and we don't know exactly what it happens, but um, we know that there's a genetic component. 
we know that um, there's brain chemistry, there's um, the stress that's going on in your life. So the situational pieces of your health, um, how you're feeling, daylight and seasons can really impact it for some people, life events, um, family and social environment. So we, you know, I touched on isolation a little bit, but really um, being significantly isolated can, can really lend itself to depression. And then just our own reaction to life situations. And again, these ideas of treatment for depression uh, look similar to anxiety, but medication, talk therapy, um, again, support groups, connecting with others, exercise and nutrition can be a really key part of overall well-being. And it helps with, you know, any of the symptoms of depression or anxiety that people are experiencing. Um, sometimes when we're feeling tired or not feeling great, it's hard to think about exercising or hard to put that extra energy into nutrition or sleep. But these are all really important components of overall well-being. Um, so we've, uh, I, you know, I've talked about distress, depression, anxiety, but I want to spend some time today really talking about wellness and how we get to a state of wellness. Um, when we think about wellness, it's important to know that what we think, how we talk, our feelings, all of that affects our greater health and well-being. And um, all of these components are really important to take into account. We can't just tinker with one little thing. Uh, we really need to take a really well-rounded approach. And resilience is a, an important piece of this. So resilience is the process and outcome of successfully adapting to difficult or challenging life experiences like a cancer diagnosis, especially through mental, emotional, and behavioral flexibility and adjustment to external and internal demands. So when we think about resilience, I oftentimes think about um, our ability to adapt and grow from a difficult situation. So we all um, know people who are uh, adapt really easily or find silver linings in growth in difficult situations. And we know people that that's more difficult for. Uh, I, I do think it's really important to note that resilience doesn't mean ignoring the emotions we experience. It's not saying like, oh, everything's fine, everything's good. It's really about fully experiencing those emotions and feelings and learning to move forward with them and learning to find growth from them. So I've talked a little bit about that person that is more resilient or more adaptive. Um, I think a lot of people maybe have heard um, glass half empty or glass half full. Uh, you know, research is really unclear as to why different um, perspectives develop. I think probably some of it's hardwired from birth and then oftentimes how we are brought up, the environment, um, the care that we have access to can all impact that. Um, and we know that, you know, they've done some articles even during or some research during COVID on stress and resiliency, optimism and pessimism and psychological flexibility. And what people have found is that psychological inflexibility um, impacts people's stress, even with COVID. And the same is true of um, a cancer diagnosis. And so when thinking about our own selves, we want to have a good sense of who are we? Are we glass half um, full people, glass half empty people? And that can help start to paying attention to what are the thoughts that are happening in our mind. Um, and so even if you are a glass half empty person, that doesn't mean that you can't be resilient. It just means that it may take a little bit more work to do. Um, and and so um, thinking about the six factors that aid recovery from uh, extreme or traumatic stress, like a diagnosis could be, um, would be this idea of actively facing fears and trying to solve problems. So instead of ignoring the problem or acting like it's not happening, really doing research, becoming knowledgeable and actively trying to um, think of things that will make the situation better. You'll see that exercise comes up again. So that's the third time we've seen that. Um, trying to be optimistic, you know, noticing that if a pessimistic thought comes up, trying to think if you can think of a counter thought for it, really following your moral compass, um, 
again, this idea of social support, nurturing friendships, seeking role models. So in the cancer community, being connected with another patient with WM, that's a great um, way to find a role model and maybe someone who's further along than you that can help help uh, show you and lead the way. And then being open-minded and flexible. Um, and I'll give some examples of, of that in a minute. Um, and then also we, uh, you know, being calm. So if you feel your nervous system kicking up, maybe taking a deep breath to help start to calm you down, lowering your shoulders, even paying attention to what's happening in your body, um, being decisive. So if there's choices to be made, certainly taking the time to make them, but ultimately making them and moving forward, um, having that tenacity and integrity, um, and then that positive thinking comes up again. So when we think about the areas that are important to nurture resilience, one is purpose and meaning. So what do you find purposeful and meaningful in life? Oftentimes the things that you found purposeful and meaningful before WM um, diagnosis are gonna be the same things that you find purposeful and meaningful after, but sometimes those may change. And so whether it's relationships with people, um, your job, a hobby, something that you enjoy doing, you really want to know, you know, what brings your life purpose. It's good to know what your strengths are. Um, a practice of gratitude can be really important. So going through the day, looking for things that you are grateful for, uh, focusing on yourself. Again, that idea of goal setting. So having some short term or long term goals connections, so our ability to connect with other people. And then humor is a great key to resilience. So finding humor in situations can be a really important part in connecting with your resiliency. So what is non-productive thinking? Um, non-productive thinking can be um, um, when we have ruminating thoughts. So like a tape that's running around in the background in our head. Um, it can um, be thinking of all the problems, but not really taking a solution focused uh, lens. It may be thinking like this only happens to me or I have no control or I'll never be happy. I'm a burden on everyone. And these are kind of like all or nothing thinking are black and white. And so it's really important that we pay attention to what is the narrative that's happening in our head how are we thinking about things? Even if we don't say it out loud, how our mind thinks about things can be really important. Um, and it's not bad. You know, we all we all have some components of um, unhelpful thinking. And oftentimes we are not paying attention to our thinking, so we don't even know that we're doing it. And so starting to pay attention to what are the thoughts that are coming up in my mind? And um, are those thoughts flexible? Are those thoughts accurate? Are, am I overgeneralizing? Can be helpful in starting to identify some of the thoughts that you can change or start to um, look at in a more optimistic way. We talked a little bit about meditation. I wanted to take a minute just to do a really small mindfulness exercise together because using our breath or using meditation can really be really important in these high stress, high distress situations. So I want to um, invite folks, and this will be a very short meditation, if, if you could just find a comfortable seat in your chair and maybe put your feet on the floor um, if you'd like to put a hand on your heart or on your belly, or maybe even both, perhaps you could close or lower your eyes. And I want to invite you just to take a, a deep breath in through your nose. Maybe you feel your belly expand as you do this. And then slowly releasing the air. And again, taking a breath in through your nose, feeling the belly rise and releasing that breath. And invite you to do one more slow, deep breath, letting the air go. 
And as you're ready, coming back into the room and the space together, um, I don't know if anyone feels different. Like my room feels a little calmer from doing that. That uh, took less than 30 seconds, but it was a moment to check in with ourselves. You know, that idea of touch can be really important of slowing down our breath. Um, it almost forces us to be in the moment not to say that our mind may not run, but when we're focusing on our breath, sometimes um, our mind has to come here in the present moment. And so doing something, you know, I think sometimes we think about meditation, we think, oh, I have to sit in a quiet room for an hour, or it's going to take all this time. But really, you know, taking just a small minute can change, um, change our body, change our mind, and it can be done very quickly. Other um, other kind of tactile techniques are anchors. Um, so affirmations, which we'll look at at the next slide, uh, a visual clue. So maybe if you're feeling distressed, you look at the sky for a minute and um, that idea of the blueness or the clouds or that interconnectivity can enter your mind briefly. Uh, some people will carry uh, something in their pocket like a smooth rock or a piece of jewelry that's meaningful or have kids or grandkids make something that you can wear around your wrist, wrist and touch. Um, and, and rituals can be very important. So uh, I talked about gratitude earlier. Gratitude can be a ritual, something that you do every night before you go to bed. Or, um, you know, if you're feeling stressed, kind of doing a little dance or shaking things out can be really helpful. So what are affirmations? Affirmations are um, a great way to um, really have some positive beliefs about yourself. Oftentimes we can write affirmations down and put them around the house, maybe put one in your wallet, uh, sticky notes on the car or the mirror when you're getting ready in the morning. You want affirmations to be believable, you know, something that you believe about yourself. And not that it's true all the time, but that it can be, um, but it is, it is true about you. And so when you read the affirmation, you're reminding yourself about this truth. Um, and it, it really, you know, it can be very easy to be self-doubting or self-loathing or let our minds run. And these affirmations can help center us or bring us back. And so these are just some examples of affirmations. You know, I trust in the flow of life. I am balanced and peaceful. I am capable and competent. But again, it's that idea of our minds can sometimes run away from us, giving ourselves this pause to come back into the present moment and remind ourselves of our inherent goodness and our inherent connect connectedness. Um, also opportunities for self-discovery. So when was the last time you did something for the first time? Doing something for the first time can take us out of our comfort zone. It uh, can cause us to laugh. It can be exhilarating. And it does this idea of bringing us back to the present moment. You know, when we're doing something for the first time, maybe we're not so skilled at it. And so we have to really focus on the activity we're doing. Uh, it also helps bond us to other people. Um, and you know, with COVID, sometimes it's hard to think, well, how could I do something for the first time if I can't, you know, leave my home or be in groups of people? But you could do a cooking class online or learn to knit or um, go on a hard uh, hike, maybe, or just thinking of something that's new that helps you connect to the present moment and connect to, um, connect to this idea of excitement and learning. Um, I did want to touch for a moment on expectations because I think expectations can be an, a really important part of being resilient. Um, it's important to note, like, do you have realistic expectations? Because unrealistic expectations oftentimes can lead us to despair um, or can lead us to, you know, not feeling good about ourselves. Uh, we know that um, folks are all individuals, we're all imperfect. And so making sure that our expectations reflect that, our expectations of ourselves and our expectations of the people who give us care can be really important. Um, when we have 
uh, good expectations, you know, they're flexible and um, they're mindful of what we have control of and what we don't have control of. And so really paying attention to what your expectations are and kind of, again, what you're thinking in your head can be very helpful when we think about resilience. <clears throat> So I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. So I'm very going to very quickly kind of sum up and do some strategies for surviving and thriving. And we touched on most of these, but a positive attitude, this idea of setting short term goals, even though it can be hard to plan, having some short term goals, but being flexible if you're not able to meet them. Um, acknowledging benchmarks, whether it's, um, you know, after being diagnosed for one year, celebrating that or, um, you know, trying something new. But these ideas of benchmarks can be really important. Connecting with other survivors um, and and people who can be those role models, maintaining the physical and mental health. So whether that's through some of the strategies we talked about today or, um, you know, uh, moving your body every day, educating yourself. Obviously, all of you are doing that today. Um, but being educated can be so helpful. Uh, surveillance, you know, uh, making sure you're doing your screenings and you're going to your medical appointments so that in between those appointments, you can spend less time being anxious and worrying because you know that you've done what you need to do. Um, separating yourself from your illness, you know, you are not your cancer. There's so much to you that is not your cancer. And sometimes when there's a lot of medical appointments or there's symptoms that can be hard to remember, but as an individual, there's many pieces to you, your relationships and who you are that is not your illness. Um, nurturing those unique talents, um, finding positive experiences, um, realizing the courage that you have, and then these ideas of challenging thoughts. So what's the evidence for this thought that I'm having right now? And how am I talking to myself? And if that's not working, then find some distractions. You know, we don't want to just sit and sit and think. It's important to think and be connected to our emotions sometimes, but sometimes we need to be distracted. Using humor, writing or drawing, mindfulness, whether it's a really short meditation like we did or, or something that's longer. Um, affirmations that we practice, counseling and support groups. Um, I listed so many because everyone's different and sometimes what works for one person won't work for another or maybe what works for us one day doesn't work for us the next. And so having you know all of these uh, tools or coping mechanisms in your pocket so you can try different ones on, um, take them off and just figure out what's working for you in the moment can be really helpful when we think of overall well-being and taking care of our mental health. So I think we are going to move into our question portion. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer, that was a very inspiring talk addressing the many challenges of well-being and survivorship and overcoming the fear that can be a tremendous concern for, for all of us and the patients living with uncertainty and unwanted isolation, and I guess more so during COVID. So thank you for a fantastic job of communicating those strategies for coping. And I love the, uh, what was it, a 30 second mindfulness. That was great. Um, thanks for that. Um, so I've got a couple of questions here. Uh, just let me enlarge that box there. So um, John, uh, tells us that he was diagnosed in 2017, but in retrospect, have probably had WM since the mid 1990s with misdiagnoses of CLL and SMZL in 2000 and 2012. I always took these pragmatically. It helped that all these were indolent and I'm probably going to die of old age first. However, I'm prone to depression and was severely affected by COVID COVID, which led to a marriage breakdown. So why am I affected by COVID and not the cancer? Um, that is a great question. Uh, I can give you some thoughts um, without more background, but really I think COVID isolated us in a way that nothing has ever isolated us before. And as human beings, really this idea of connection is so important. And um, connection over 
internet, phone and Zoom is one thing, but connection um, in person, leaving our houses, being surrounded by the energies of other people can also be key to that. And COVID, um, one, there was so much uncertainty. So everyone was feeling this uncertainty. And also we, we, we were isolated and lost a lot of that connectivity. And so that may be one reason that it connect, that it impacted you more. Um, but it also sounds like you've had a lot of things happening, happening. And so, you know, maybe we can handle one thing and then another and then another, but there is kind of this cumulative effect of, of multiple things happening. And so um, just being mindful of that, but the fact that you're aware of it is really important um, and, and reaching out and looking for some of those connections may be, may be helpful. Thank you. Uh, and, and David asks, uh, when I do feel a bit down or worried, I often do not want to talk to my wife as I'm aware of how much she already worries about me and the WM. And I often think it's harder on her as a caregiver Sometimes I just need to vent. Is that is that a normal response? Oh my goodness, that is so normal. Um, you, you know, we hear a lot of times partners try to protect each other, which is a beautiful thing about being in a relationship of this idea of taking care of one another. Um, and and um, also, you know, things are really hard for caregivers because there is a helplessness that, um, you know, watching your partner going through something and not being able to do anything about it. So I would say everything that you said is really normal. Um, two thoughts I have. One is, uh, I think partners should talk about this. You know, I have these feelings. Sometimes I don't want to tell you because I don't want to burden you. Um, and really you're just putting it out there. It doesn't mean that you have to start telling them everything, but I think it's good that there's not an elephant in the room that people understand what's happening because oftentimes when we are holding these things, um, our partners do know and they do sense and we may take it out in other ways. And then my other suggestion is having a support group, someone else with WM, a friend, um, it's okay for our partners not to be our everything. It is okay that we take some of these fears or some of uh, these downtimes and talk about them with other people, but we have to make sure we have cultivated those networks and we have those other people because the hardest part is holding them inside and not sharing them with anyone. Um, but having those support groups or or journaling or you know a way to process those feelings is really important, whether it's with your partner or someone outside of outside of that connection. Um, but I hear that all the time. And so it's a really, what you're experiencing is really normal. Thank you, Jennifer. And so I made a comment, but it's, it's sort of um, complemented by a couple of other kind of questions that are coming. And it talks about um, our caregivers or our partners um, and how sometimes, uh, certainly I meet caregivers or partners whose, whose husbands or wives are in denial of their condition. Um, and so um, this can be an enormous burden. And I, I sometimes really do worry about the mental health of the partner or the carer rather than the, the person with the WM. How best can we, so these, these are people with probably no illness or they're getting on with their life. How can we best advise these people or help these people? For example, in the, in the UK, we have a a carers support group, which is a brilliant group, and 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 that helps. So, anything else that we could should think of? I um, a caregiver support group or a carers support group is beautiful. I always suggest those. Um, and oftentimes, you know, we don't allow caregivers in patient groups, and we don't allow patients in caregiver groups because both sets of people need a place that they can talk about their fears, frustration, sadness, that maybe is outside of um, their partner being involved in it. Um, I also think it's great for caregivers to have a therapist, someone that they can bounce ideas off of and process things that are happening. And then all the wellness activities that we talked about for patients are important for caregivers too. Sometimes caregivers feel guilty taking time on their own or doing so something for themselves, but really, as um, you know, if patients can help create that space for caregivers to take time for themselves, that space for caregivers to 
not feel guilty caring for themselves, that can go a long way with them, you know, taking the time for themselves and doing those doing those pieces of self-care. But there's a lot of guilt in caregiving. And so acknowledging that um, can be really helpful in giving caregivers permission to take care of themselves. Thank you. And, and, and Sharon tells us, but building on that, I guess, is that Sharon says that I've found going to therapy has helped me find a place to deal with my concerns with WM and living in the COVID era. Exercise has always been a part of my life. One thing I get told a lot is you don't look like you have cancer. And I always struggle with a response. Even when I was very sick, I was still exercising seven days a week. So Sharon, you're a lady after my own heart. But yes, I have that response as well. You don't like, look like you have cancer. There's a kind of, you kind of go into sort of a, a guilt, a guilt feeling that you, um, you're ill, but nobody thinks you look ill. So how do we deal with that, uh, Jennifer? Yeah, I, I think it's hard um, because oftentimes people say that well intentioned um, and it's, you know, it's not a helpful comment and um, and how we look doesn't always tell the full story story of how we feel. Um, it, you know, I one is is giving people the benefit of the doubt. Oftentimes people don't know what to say. And so that's what they say. They didn't mean it. They probably didn't think about it. They probably would say it whether you look good or not. Um, and so, you know, trying to give people a little grace of not exactly knowing what to say. And then, um, and then, you know, focusing on you, what, what do you feel like? And you feel, do you want that person to know? And for some people, you may want them to know all of it because maybe they're a really close friend and for others, it may be an acquaintance and it's not worth kind of the emotional toll that it will take to explain it. And both of those things are okay. I think what's important is that there's enough people in your life or your circle who really do know how you feel and do understand the ups and downs and that the other people who aren't in that circle, um, you know, they're going to think what they think and that's, that's okay. But really being, um, you know, knowing how you are and, and allowing yourself to feel that regardless of what the external people think or see of you. It's a hard, it's a hard thing though, and it comes up a lot. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. And just finally, uh, from Richard, who's sixty-eight and was diagnosed earlier this year, is it normal to find it hard not to think about death? Other than the Waldenstroms, I've been in pretty good health. I guess this is something we all think about. Yeah, you know, um, getting a cancer diagnosis really forces um, folks to face their mortality, and so thinking about death is a really normal reaction to a diagnosis. Even if um, things are stable, it just, uh, I don't know if you remember the first slide of kind of the broken window, but our perspective shifts or how we see the world shifts a little bit. And so that's really normal. Um, part, partly spend some time with that, you know, spend some time thinking about what, what death means and what are you worried about? And what are the things that you would want to accomplish? Um, I also think for a lot of people getting, you know, as the saying goes, your affairs in order. So making sure that you have an advanced directive or whatever type of paperwork exists where you live um, so that your friends and family know your wishes. And I will say after a diagnosis, that's very hard to do because oftentimes our friends and family want to say, oh, you don't need to do that or don't worry about that. And that's really oftentimes their own fears creeping up of them not wanting to face it. Um, but once you have taken some time to think about it and really get some things prepared in an order, oftentimes we're able to put that that feeling on the shelf a little bit. And that doesn't mean it's not gonna come up again. You know, every time that you have a blood test or a doctor's appointment, my guess is it may bubble to the surface a little bit. Um, but if you can take some time thinking about it, maybe even talking about it um, and getting things in order, it gives our mind a chance to relax and to not have to think about it all the time. Thank you, Jennifer. That's wonderful. So uh, I think that's us come to the end of this presentation. So I want to say a big thank you to Jennifer for volunteering your time on a Sunday in Washington, D.C. and for an excellent presentation today. And on behalf of the IWMF, 
Um, I would also like to extend our appreciation to the this year's Ed Forum title sponsors, Beijing, Pharma Silix, uh, Cyclix Janssen, as well as Selectar Biosciences, the Treadway Foundation and X4 Pharmaceuticals. Uh, thank you to the audience for joining us today. I hope you'll agree with me that that was an amazing presentation. Um, and just a reminder that the IWMF Networking Lounge will be op open today at 1.35 p.m. I'm guessing that's your Eastern time. Uh, following the, uh, follow the prompts on your screen to drop in for our hosted community conversations. And I just want to say uh, good evening to you all from, from England and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>